He should have been here by now. We should have arrived by now. We should have started by now. This thing should have ended by now. We should be able to see him and not just hear him by now. By now. The two words that express our expectation that the hands of the clock should be the hands that deliver our results because you guys know the expectation. We sing about two to three songs. By the time that's done, we see you. There may or may not be a goofy or a serious video, but then right after that, on the stage, there is your communicator ready to go. And when that didn't happen, what did you think? Something's wrong. Wait, what's going on? Maybe you started to feel a little bit of worry or anxiety or even embarrassment for the team because Spence probably left the mic in the bathroom again and he was late on stage because he had to run back and get it. And in this case, that may or may not be true, but that's neither here nor there. Why is it that the moment that we needed to wait or that time was needed It was automatically interpreted as a problem. I'm just your messenger today, okay? So don't aim at me and don't cancel me because the word that I'm going to start off with today has the potential to get me canceled. If those who don't agree with it, if it just doesn't sit right with them, but the word we're going to start with today is the word we've already had to do And that is, wait. (laughs) Well, y'all can't wait for this one to be done, can you? Wait. But I'm 15 and a half, and I'm ready to go from zero to 60. Wait. Now, I've been at this job for two years. I, I deserve more, more opportunity, more pay, more responsibility, Wait, I'm ready for the next thing. I'm ready for over here. I'm done with this here. I'm ready. Wait, I know a couple of newly engaged couples. Congratulations. Wait. (laughs) See, everything that I just told you is not a direction about waiting. No, I'm, I'm just, I'm empathizing. I'm empathizing with the pain of patience because in our our cancel culture, if something goes against our way, our way of thinking, or God forbid, our pursuits, hit the cancel button, hit the big X, like the symbol on our Don't Shoot the Messenger series right now. We just, we cancel it. And for some reason, we think that patience is out to cancel our plans our process, our pursuits. And so the first time we're faced with patience, we cancel patience. We cancel patience like a doctor on vacation. I'll prove it. Our favorite toy, the internet, right? Did you know that about over 40% of people will cancel an uploading page if it takes longer than three seconds to upload. One, two, three, oh my God, this is taking taking forever. We throw it out the window. My, My brethren, have we so easily forgotten the days of Hey, baby. No, I'm just waiting on the internet to load up. (laughs) Yeah, don't wait up. I'll see you tomorrow, or in two days. (laughs) See, it used to be that when we wanted to experience the gloriousness of unlimited information that we had to wait for it. But for some reason, nowadays, and maybe it's because we're so microwaved, that we interpret so easily 
wait for worry. And we, in, we interpret waiting for we should just walk away. We think that patience will cancel our process, will cancel our plans, will cancel our pursuits, cancel our promises. Promises. See, that's, that's God territory right there. God, God's a promise giver. God gets promises like, I have plans to prosper you. Promises like, I will complete the good work I began in you. Promise is like one of my favorite verses. This is one of my life verses, y'all. You should have life verses. Verses that you, you know normally by memorization. You may have got it tatted on you in some ink, but I hope that it's written on your heart. And this is one of mine. I love this verse. Psalm 37, 4 says, take delight. Other interpretations say, delight yourself. Take delight in the Lord. He will give you the desires of your heart. Hannah. Hannah had a desire. Hannah had a desire, like many women, to be a mom. She had a desire to be a mom, and this was something that she had been waiting for for a very long time. And as if the pain of patience wasn't enough, there was a rival in her life, someone that was close to her life, and she was a mom. And she would throw it in Hannah's face. See, back in this time and in this culture, it was very honorable for a woman to be a mother. And when you didn't, it could really damage the value that you thought you had. And so for this other woman to constantly be pointing the finger, the finger at Hannah and saying, you, you got what I got. She would tease her. She would mock her. You know what I'm saying? She would keep pictures from last month's vacation just to make sure she had enough to post this week just to stay ahead of Hannah. This would crush her, obviously. Downcast her, break her spirit, make her lose self-confidence. Now, Hannah and her husband were God-fearing people. They loved and worshipped the Lord, and yearly they would go to Shiloh to bring offering and to worship. And so was this painful patience persisted for Hannah on this particular year? Something different happens. We're going to go to first. For Samuel chapter 1, verse 9, once they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now, Eli the priest was sitting on his chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house in her deep anguish. Deep anguish. I've been waiting, wishing even, praying longing for, to the point that it hurts. In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly, and she made a vow, saying, Lord Almighty, if, two little letters, very important to this scripture, very important to our pursuit Lord Almighty, if, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life. No razor will ever be used on his head. What she was saying is she was going to dedicate him as a Nazarite. And it was customary for a Nazarite to never cut their hair as a symbol that they were a Nazarite, she was dedicating him. Just like we see baby dedications on Mother's Day here, people choosing to raise their children in the way of the Lord, but she was going the extra step saying, I'm, I'm going to enlist him right now in ministry. Our natural instinct is to feel like patience will cancel our plans and cancel our pursuits. Patience doesn't cancel our pursuits. Patience proves our pursuits. Hannah waited years. She waited embarrassingly painful years. But she didn't let that deter her from her pursuit. She wanted to be a mom. Probably felt like she was destined to be a mom. Maybe even felt like there was a calling for her to be a mom. 
and this pain of patience. She didn't let it remove her from her pursuit. She didn't let it take away her desires. As a matter of fact, all it did was prove her desire. If there's one thing that we know about time, there's an age-old saying that we know about time. As a matter of fact, since you're watching on video and you're joining us online, I want to make sure you're awake now. If you're online, you don't have to say this with us because you're probably alone. But if you are in a group, great. But for everybody in Seaburg, everybody in my Hub City campus, I want you to fill in the blank. This is what we know. We know that time will... Please tell me. Make some noises, please, if, if half the campus at least said tell. Because I know some of you didn't. Somebody said over here said time keeps on slipping. And somebody in the balcony was like, hey, time of my life. That's no, time will tell. Patience will prove. It'll prove what? What does patience prove? First of all, it proves whether you really want what you think you want. From God. Parents, you know this. Parents have a little tool that's our, our first word of the day called wait. This is a little life hack that works when your kids from around toddler to, to like six. Because around seven, they catch you and they start looking at you like, okay. But between toddler and six, it has like a 50% success rate, okay? And it's the wait tool. Your kid comes to you and wants to do something or wants you to buy something or can we do something and you just for whatever reason, maybe you're just being a lazy parent. I don't know. But you don't want to be the bad parent who says no. You can deploy the wait. Because the kid will go, okay. And what will happen is if they really want it, it will come up again days later. But if they didn't really want it, they'll just forget about it. and just kind of go on about their way. And now you can get back to being a lazy parent, and you don't have to be the bad parent that said no. Time will tell. Patience will prove whether or not you really want something or not. Hannah never changed her pursuit, her desire. It'll prove whether you're ready for your desire or not. Patience will prove your origin of your desire. Where is this coming from? Why do I want this? Is it because it's all I've ever seen and known? Is it a calling? Is it a purpose? Is it of God? Is it just that I want it? Am I thirsty for something? Patience will prove the origin of your desire, why you actually want something. Patience proved Hannah's true desire. What Hannah discovered in this moment while she was praying. She, she learned the reality of this verse that if I delight myself in the Lord, he'll give me the desires of my heart. But what she realized that delighting myself in the Lord actually starts to prioritize my desires. It made her realize that yeah, I, I actually still want to be a mom. I still want this job. I still want this school on the other side of the country. I still want them. Look at her, girl. I still have the desire. But when I delight myself in the Lord, all my other desires now start to take a second place down the tier. Me just knowing that I'm living to please God actually starts to become my first and foremost desire. So when Hannah says, God, the best way that I can thank you if you give me this is I'll dedicate him back to you. And it looks like in our mind that she just made a nice deal. Okay, I can make a deal with God. God, if you do this, I don't know. That's not what her if was. Her if was not conditional or a contract. Her if was submission. I want this, God, but if. If you say so. So on that day, Hannah wasn't making a deal. God was dealing with her. When I delight myself in the Lord, this is what activated in Hannah's heart. This is why she could say, you give me a son, God, I'll dedicate him back to you. She was only 
agreeing to do what she had already done for her own life and her own heart. She was going to raise her son in the same. When delighting in the Lord became her primary desire, she was okay telling God, I still want this. But if you never give it to me and the desire stays, I will pursue it for the rest of my life because I'm no longer pursuing a result. I'm pursuing you. And you see this when Hannah leaves the temple. There's, a little, there's some verses in between here. I'm going to go back. We're going to talk about it, but I'm going to skip down. When Hannah leaves the temple, Eli says something to her. Gives her some encouragement. And this is her reply. Verse 118, she says, may your servant find favor in your eyes. She's saying, I, I left a prayer here. I, I hope God answers it according to his will and in my favor. I, I hope what you are agreeing with me in prayer that happens in my favor. And she went away and she ate something and her face was no longer downcast. You know why that's significant? Because prior to this Year after year after year, day after day after day, even being tormented by somebody who wanted to throw it in her face and she had not get a ride where she wanted to be, Hannah would let that tear her up inside. She would let it bring her to tears. She would let it give her anxiety, worry. She would let it question her self-value and her worth and her place on this planet. And on that day, Hannah took all that back. She took it all back because she surrendered to God her expectations and her clock. She was willing to commit that even if she longed for this the rest of her life, she was okay if she never got it. Because her desire, she was now committing to being the delight of the Lord. It was a powerful moment in her life that she committed to patience. Patience presents God's power. Patience presents God's power. See, the fruit is the presentation of the root. Whatever the roots are, that's what tree it's going to be. Whatever tree it's going to be, that's what fruit is going to hang from in Galatians. Chapter 5, verse 22 says that the fruit of God's spirit is love. Two weeks ago, Patrick talked about the fruit of joy. Last week, Pastor Dave talked about the fruit of peace. And this week, we're talking about the fruit of forbearance, a.k.a. patience. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control against such things there are no law. It's not easy to do any of these things in this scripture. To be loving, to be patient, to be kind. It isn't easy to do any of those things. And as a matter of fact, it takes power. And so when we exert them, when we show that fruit, that's evidence of a powerful God. When we can have joy, when things in our life aren't going right, that's the evidence that there's a powerful God. When we have peace, no matter the midst of the storms that we're in, that's the evidence of a powerful God. And when we're patient, we're literally showing the fruit to the world that there's a powerful God. Because being patient, it isn't just waiting, is it? Because we, we have to wait whether we choose to or not. We don't choose to wait in traffic, but we have to. We sure don't choose to wait on the doctor, but you'll get there early and he'll pull you in late. We don't choose to wait on our fast food. And when it finally comes out and they're like, hey, thank you so sorry for giving me mom. And y'all better not have dropped the fries in the bottom of the bag. No, that's not, that's not patience. We waited, but that's not patience. Patience isn't just waiting. It's how you wait. It's waiting like Hannah. Hannah's a great example because nothing will push your patience more than when you are being patient and you're being patient the right way. Hannah went to God with her problem. 
She was doing this the right way. She was doing this God's way. She went to go pray about it. And nothing will push us to the edge of our last drop of patience, like when we're doing something not only right, but doing it God's way. And somebody, usually church folk, wants to look into your life and judge what's going on. Take, take a look. In verse 12, this is when she's praying. Hey, so Hannah's here praying, right? Now, again, I already bailed on my man Eli because at the end he gives her encouragement, okay? He may have had the best intentions here, like most of us do. But watch what happens. As she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. So he sees her, all right? He's, he's in the auditorium and he looks over at, at the prayer tent. He looks over at the prayer banner and sees her by herself running her mouth. And this is what he assumes. Hannah was praying in her heart and her lips are moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk. Stay with me. And he said to her, I mean, how long are you going to do this? How long are you going to stay drunk? Why don't you put away your wine? Uh, not so, my Lord, Hannah replied. You know, I'm going to stop right there. Like, already she's at a 10 for 10. Because this is the reason why this, this right here, I'll be, I'll, I'll be, I'll be honest. I'm going to be honest. I'm be tra- don't judge me. I'm going to be transparent. I, I know how to get defensive. I know how to get defensive. All right? Like, she was doing the right thing, and somebody peered into her life and assumed and judged and said, this is why Spencer was born as Spencer, a guy here in this generation, and was not Hannah in this generation. Because if this would have been me, Okay, first of all, judge me one more time. Get in my business one more time, and you're going to find out why they call me Hannah. Judge me one more time, and I'm going to hand a whooping right to you. You'll know me. But that's why God let this be Hannah's story, not my story, because this is one of the ones that God wants to actually show that somebody did it right. Patience isn't just about waiting. It's how you wait. It's waiting right. It's waiting with the fruit of the Spirit. Patience protects all the other fruits. Patience, when you're patient, it makes sure that you can still be kind and still be loving and still be gentle. Even when you're exhausted, tired, impatient, when you're testing to get impatient but you're yielding to patience, it's the one fruit that protects all the other ones. Show the evidence that God's hand is on your life. Hannah replies, Not so, my Lord. I'm a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I wasn't, pour, I was pour, I wasn't pouring up at the bar. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Don't take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of the great anguish and grief. Eli answered, oh, my, my bad, my bad. And I forgives, right? That's patience. Patience will bring forgiveness to others who don't always deserve it. Eli answered, go in peace. And may the God of Israel grant you what you ask for him. And Hannah does eventually conceive a child. Samuel, who becomes the prophet, who appoints David, and through the line of David will come Jesus, all part of God's bigger plan. Even though there was patience on the front end. Even though there was a waiting on the front end. This kind of patience can only happen with the power and presence of God, y'all. Because we've tried and we failed. We know where our limit for patience is and we can't go any further. And when we can't, God kicks in. But to have the power of God's presence, you, you have to have his Holy Spirit. You have to invite his spirit to reunite with yours. Jesus was patient. Jesus is the reason we can be reunited with God. Jesus was patient all the way to the cross. Jesus was painfully patient for three days of torture only to await a grave. But from out of that grave, his patience led towards a resurrection, a rebirth, a coming back to life. Our faith in Jesus today can assure us of forgiveness, being reunited with God, being empowered by his spirit to yield all of the fruits of his spirit. 
Maybe that's a decision that you've never even thought about or you're making today. But when you make it, just know that God's presence and power and spirit will now begin to take work in your life. Because without the power of God, it's so impossible to live out these fruits. They're his fruits from his roots. We have to have roots in him to show these fruits, to be patient. Because without patience, we'll think that we can actually, this is going to sound bad, but we'll think that we can actually do the work of God without him. We'll think that we can actually move God's hand. Every time that we allow impatience to manifest in our life, it's like we're taking the hands of the clock and the fight now becomes God's hands versus our hands and our hands are the hour hand of the clock. We think that if we can somehow just move this thing forward, then it'll move God's hand in our life. God's hand doesn't move like the hands on the clock. The hands on the clock move in a circle. And when we allow the hands of the clock to tell us that we should have been somewhere else by now, been better by now, they should have walked into our life by now, they should be healed by now, this should have changed by now, this expectation should have been fulfilled by now. We allow the hands of the clock, just like it spins on the face of the clock, to spin us all around. We start off with both hands up at church, like 12 o'clock, praising. And then by 2 o'clock, our arms are locked. And then by five, we're wondering how long we got to strive. By six, we think we should just get a whole other mix. By eight, we're looking around with jealousy and hate. By 10, we think it should just end. And 12, just starting it all over again. And this is why God's hand doesn't move like the hands on the clock. The hands on the clock go in a circle. God's hand goes forward and upward. God isn't worried about how long something takes. Even if he is going to give you the desire of your heart, he's not worried about how long it takes. He's worried about how long it's going to last when he gives it to you. And sometimes the reason we haven't been given the very thing that we want, the very desire that we have, even if it's a godly one, is because we are not yet who we are supposed to be. And whenever you are not where you're supposed to be, God is working on who you want to be because only who you want to be can handle where you want to be and patience is the oven he's going to use to prepare you. God's not worried about how long something will take. He's worried about how much it's going to take from you. How long will your marriage last when he finally brings them into your life? Will your business be able to keep up when he blesses you with it? Will these relationships be deep enough when I bring you into connection with these people? Will you still want to be a parent, a good parent, when they're no longer a cute, cuddly bundle of joy anymore. The clock is a tool in God's hands, but it is not God's hand. So the clock means nothing to God in our process. And in the place of that, Where we look at the clock, God tells us to put our eyes on patience because patience now will be persistence later. Patience now will be persistence later. That means if we long for it, we'll build the strength to be strong for it. If we had to wait for it, we will always do whatever it takes for it. If we had to pray through the night for it, we'll be quick to stand up and fight for it. If we had to anticipate its arrival, we won't easily dissipate its survival. If we had to be patient for it, wait for it. 
then we will persist when failure comes straight forward. Patience now is God preparing us for persistence later. God has been persistent with you. He's waited patiently for you. And if today is the day that you remove the hands of the clock and give your time to God first in faith in Jesus, will you let us know if you're making that decision? It is just that. It's a decision. It's a yes to Jesus. I believe in you. I desire what you did for me. I believe in your death, your burial, your resurrection for me. And it's a simple yes. And if you make the yes today, just tell us, please. We want you to know God. That's what you just chosen. We want you to find family and make a difference here. And finding family is what you will do if you connect with us and tell us you made that decision. Shoot us a text. Text Jesus' name to A1411. Why don't we have a moment like Hannah today? Hannah had a moment where she committed to patience about the desires of her heart. And in a moment, we're about to sing. Honestly, it's one of my favorite songs. I love this song because I trust God with this part of my life of him writing my story, writing your story. He knows the desires of your heart. He knows whether he should give them to you or not. He knows whether you're ready for them or not. He knows whether there's something better than them or not. And so today, as we say these words, God, you arrive at the right time. You are never late. Why am I surprised? Not at all. In the highest of the mountaintops where you grant me my desires or in the lowest where I don't know if I ever see it, you never change. You are my one desire. Why don't you stand wherever you're at, even if you're home online. Pray these words. Say these words. Sing these words. Yield your clock to God.